ذنبي عظيم آه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Peace be with you بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين In the name of Allah The compassion of the merciful All praise is due to Allah And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his prophet Muhammad His family, his companions and all of his followers Until the day of resurrection I welcome you to this new episode of our series, Human Rights, A Muslim Perspective. Let me emphasize that what I said in this series is basically my own, and of course, that's how I understand being someone who works in the fields of human rights, understand things according to the Islamic perspective. And I will address today the issue of guarantees under the Islamic system where the human rights will be applied because you can never see any guarantee and no force whatsoever was made when these declarations of human rights were made by even the United Nations. It was left to countries to do their own, to select whatever they want in this field. But the most important thing is when we are addressing this we need to apply a very fair and strong and qualified judicial system. That is the way to guarantee that these human rights are protected. For example, look at the saying of one of the scholars of Islam, Al-Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. What he said, أمور الناس تستقيم في الدنيا مع العدل. He said the matters of people will be straight in this life by justice. وَلِهَذَا قِيلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُقِيمُ الدَّوْلَةَ الْعَادِلَةَ وَلَوْ كَانَتْ كَافِرًا That's why it was said that Allah will maintain a just state even if that is disbelieving state, a state that was not based on Islam or not ruled by Muslims وَلَا يُقِيمُ الدَّوْلَةَ الظَّالِمَةَ وَإِنْ كَانَتْ مُسْلِمَةَ And that Allah will not maintain a state that is unjust even if it is a Muslim state. It is so important that we emphasize the concept of justice and justice in Islam is absolute. You have to be just with yourself, just with your own relatives, just with your own Interest, even if it goes against your own interests, against the interest of the relatives, against the interest of people in authority or people that you think you're supporting, your own kinfolk and so on and so forth. This has in no way any possibility for violating justice. And that's what was emphasized by the saying of this great scholar of Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. He mentioned this and it was said after him so many people repeated this that even a Muslim state which is unjust will be subject to the destruction of Allah or Allah will replace it with another state because it will not maintain the rulership this rulership will not be maintained we can see real examples of this nowadays and in the past because if people step on the rights of others if they practice injustice, if they go against the rights of people, if they transgress, if they are indeed ruling people by the sword and the stick and not by justice, then obviously we can see that they will not live for long. And we've seen many systems change in particular countries because of this. So unless people get away from this concept of police state into states run by justice, by mercy, by kindness, by acceptance of people, spreading this inside countries that will lead into the respect of the rights 
of people based first on education, conviction, and faith in Allah's reward and punishment in this regard, and again by a very strict judicial system that follows justice and is respectable because of justice. If that is maintained, we can see the prolonging of its life. As we can see also real examples of countries which apply justice, which are not Muslims, but they have been in rule for centuries because, again, of applying justice. And Muslim countries which were ruled by unjust rulers and they were driven out from their own positions in a short time. In the hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُقَدِّسُ أُمَّةً لَا يُقَدْرُ الضَّعِيفِ فِيهَا حَقُّهُ Allah does not put any value or great respect for any nation that does not take for the weak his own right. Yes, indeed. Allah will not have any value, will not have no respect for a nation that has this. And that's why the state has to maintain this. Any state would have to support a judicial system and to make it free. Do not charge people. Unfortunately, nowadays, if you want to have a good lawyer, you have to have lots of money. And that is a problem because if I have a right and I don't know how to present it and how to do it within this very complicated system of the due process of the law, then I am at disadvantage. Law has to be free, has to be open to all people. The state has to bear all the costs of this because it's no less than other rights of people such as health, security, and education. All of these are important, equally important in a judicial system that is fair and free for everyone. If anyone who's not able to pay any dues for lawyers and barristers and what have you, then the state has to hire one for them who is qualified and even takes the case strongly because against anyone stepping on the rights of another person. The problem is that even those who are transgressing would have their own lawyers, and that is a problem. That's where the consciousness of lawyers comes. These lawyers have to be very aware of their responsibility towards Allah and towards people. They cannot defend anyone who has a lost case, a wrong case. They shall advise a person who comes to them and says, I need you to support me to get such and such. If they have no right, you shall not stand by their side. This is as simple as this. In the hadith, which is hadith Qudsi, إِنَّ الْمُقْسِطِينَ عَلَى مَنَابِرَ مِن نُورٍ عَنْ يَمِينِ الرَّحْمَانِ وَكِلْتَ يَدَيْهِ يَمِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْدِلُونَ فِي حُكْمِهِمْ وَأَهْلِهِمْ وَمَا وُلُّوا Look at this beautiful hadith. Because in the hadith, those who are just will be on pulpits made from light, meaning higher places made from light, and they will be to the right of Ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both of his hands are right, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should be careful here because the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not like our hands or the hands of any creature. We cannot know how are Allah's hands, subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do they look like? What is their size and so on? We cannot do this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like any of us. Laysa kamithlihi shay is none unto like him. So that is important, but that means a respect for them. And look, because of their justice, they would be so much high on the day of judgment besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alladina ya'dilun, because they are just in their rule. Fi hukmihim wa ahlihim. And even among their own family members and kinfolks, 
وَمَا وُلُّوا And whatever responsibilities they were given, they will all be truthful and honest and fair in whatever they do. So the justice is always their own tradition and their own way of life. That's why they deserve this respect and deserve this status on the Day of Judgment. So justice has to be done for everyone, which would be including Muslims and non-Muslims, all together, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. There is no difference. Justice under the law of Allah and the Sharia has to be practiced, regardless who the person is standing there, as we explained earlier in an example of an Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu sitting with a Jew under the Islamic State before the Qadi Shuraih. They stood together in front of the law. There was no difference between the commander of the believers and one of the people under the Islamic State who was not a Muslim. He was a Jew at the time. And Shuraih, the judge, gave the judgment for this Jew against Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Although Ali ibn Abi Talib at the end had the right, but he could not prove it, and therefore in front of the law, you are going to lose if you don't have any evidence in your hands. And you cannot bring a witness from your own household, like your family or your son or your servant and so on, because they would have an interest in supporting you. Look at the fairness. This is all because they were seeking justice and they were fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to transgress against his commands. I'll have more to close on the subject after this short break. So please stay with us. This is Jafar Idris and you are watching. I need to end with the last parts of the guarantees in terms of the importance of putting human rights to execution, to execute them in reality, and to put them in the field, and not to keep them as a lofty idea up in the sky. And unless we do this, we will not have any ability to do so. Yes, some of the non-Muslim countries have applied these guarantees and have been winning and have been gaining in fact, solid grounds in maintaining their being because they have applied these rules of justice which are emphasized by Islam. Look at what Umar ibn Khattab anhu said in a writing to his own people. He said, مَا أَصَلْتُكُمْ لِتَضْرِبُوا أَبْشَارَ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهِ لَا أُوتَى بِعَامِلٍ ضَرَبَ أَبْشَارَ النَّاسِ مِنْ غَيْرِ حَدٍ إِلَّا اقْتَصَصْتُ مِنْهَ I have not sent you to strike people on their backs or sides, meaning to hit their skins with sticks or to make them fearful. I swear by Allah that if I would be brought one of you, anyone working for the state who has hit the skin of anyone, meaning among people, with that a penalty required by Sharia, ah, which is a had, except that I will, in fact, take the right of this person from him. I'm the one to apply this, because you are supposed to rule people and to be just with them under the teachings of Islam, but if you do not do so, I will have, as the head of state, I would have to apply this. Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu, was very known for his justice, also said, the following in his own judicial message, which he sent to his own governors in various areas of the Islamic State. He said, you'd have to be fair and equal between the people who are standing before you seeking justice. In your own sitting, in your looking at them and expressing your own words to them and even when you pass the judgment you'd have to be fair and equal 
حتى لا يطمع شريف في حيفه so a noble person will not have any interest or probably have a wish that you would turn to him ولا ييأس ضعيف من عدلك and a weak will not be desperate of your justice so even the way you look the way you sit how you conduct yourself you have to be very fair look at this extent of seeking justice and the directions the governor of the khalifa of muslims is giving to his own governors so we know that everyone is innocent until proven guilty and anyone claiming to have something done would have to bring in an evidence if they are the plaintiffs if they are the plaintiff they would have to prove this point in front of the judge and if they are the defendant if they don't have the evidence they could only have a testimony or oath that they are telling the truth and therefore they will be saved if the plaintiff did not present the evidence that's why it is so important that even hudud which are the penalties according to the sharia will not be applied unless supported by strong evidence which is in the sharia itself for example a committing zina or adultery or fornication has to be either admitted by the by the person who committed this or we'd have to have four witnesses testifying that they have seen exactly not only for example a man on top of a woman but they go beyond that into seeing the actual intercourse taking place unless they give the testimony to that the fact that they would be in the same place the same room and the same bed together still is not enough to give the evidence that they have committed zina fornication or adultery that's why the hudud or the penalties are guarded by doubts al hududu madru'atun bi shubuhat that's why it's so important in the islamic system to guard against the stepping over the the human rights of others look even the rights of the accused people who are being accused shall not in any way have their own admission taken or statements or the agreement that they've done or committed this wrongdoing by force by coercion by harassment by compulsion by any means of getting this taken from them without their full consent and full agreement under no pressure when they are fully sane and they understand exactly what they were saying this is important and this is the opinion of the majority of scholars although there have been some scholars who said that yes you can sometimes get the admission of committing a crime from some bad people bad criminals by force because they will not say it unless you put some pressure on them but the majority of scholars are saying no this cannot be because you are stepping on the just due process of the law which is not right one other point is that for example you cannot take someone by the crime of another you cannot have this accusation of for example family relatives because someone within the family has committed wrongdoing allah ta'ala says wala taziru waziratun wizra ukhra no one shall carry the sin of another because we are all responsible for our affairs as individuals look at the sharia what it says in regards to the protection of the witnesses because again as we said that in regards to the accused then we are saying the same thing regarding the witnesses there shall not be any pressure any coercion any harassment any harm done to the witnesses in any case as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
ولا يضار كاتب ولا شهيد and there shall be no harm put on the scribe or the witness so witness shall be left free to speak his consciousness and he's responsible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether he says the truth or not but this is important we shall not have any doubt in the testimony of witnesses unless we do have a reason a strong reason or evidence that they may be lying we can do any checks any cross examination any test of lying and to do all these things in order to make sure that yes that we have a true and genuine witness but shall not in any way be forced or put any harassment or pressure on them to give their testimonies what i'm going to conclude with is that the protection and care given to human rights shall be a way of life and we shall maintain the human rights respect throughout the process of the law even when someone has been proven guilty and we are executing the penalty against this person they still be protected and other rights on him shall not be violated such as his wealth his house or place of residence his own family in fact the muslim state is supposed to support his family while he's in prison or put to some kind of punishment even when a person is put to death as a fair penalty for what he committed still we need to treat him well in terms of giving him the opportunity to know why we did so and that he shall be given a notice ahead of time before the execution of this penalty and even when this person has been executed then they shall be he's entitled to his own way of being treated as a muslim as a dead muslim he shall be washed he shall be put in a coffin he shall be prayed upon the prayer of the deceased all of these shall be given to a person so the violation of human rights is always a concern and shall stay as a concern and we as muslims are supposed to be the first ones to defend human rights according to the islamic law and system and at the same time be the first ones to put them to practice wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alamin sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh يا واسع العفو يا واسع العفو والغفران والكرم قد جئت مرتجفا من زلة القدم ذنبي عظيم يا ذا الجلال